So welcome everyone. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you to the virtual launch of the Precision Behavioral Health Initiative at Cornell Tech. It's exciting to have you join our event. Um, so we've had about uh, 250 people who have registered and if we do the math, probably 50 of us are likely to be struggling with our mental wellness. It might be stress, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. But too often, um, this very important aspect of our health is ignored. Treatments are siloed, but over time, mental health problems start to impact all aspects of our lives, our physical health, our productivity, our relationships, and financial stability. And unlike many health conditions, mental and behavioral health problems do not have definitive diagnostic tests or a single drug that can provide a cure. The symptoms of mental health decline vary across people and manifest as changes in behavior over time. The treatment is also gradual. Often it requires pharmacological and therapeutic intervention and need to be personalized. On top of all of this, access to behavioral health is often limited. In the United States, 60% of the counties do not have a practicing psychiatrist. Measurement and treatment of behavioral health problems need to happen in everyday context as we live our lives and adapt to our unique situations. We know technology can play a meaningful role here. And that is why we're launching the Precision Behavioral Health Initiative to ramp up the research, institutional support, and implementation efforts around novel comp computing solutions for behavioral health with clinical actionability and patient needs in mind. Projects under this initiative include the creation of novel devices that capture meaningful health signals, AI models that balance interpretability of these signals with users' privacy and security, and intervention technologies that can amplify patient-clinician relationships rather than replacing them. To discuss the potential of precision technology for behavioral health, we've gathered a panel of experts who are building the technology, clinicians who are thinking deeply about how digital mental health solutions, in, um, solutions in, uh, can be translated into patient um, care, and from those who are developing products that are making novel solutions available to users at scale. Then we'll hear a set of four short talks about ongoing research happening at Cornell Tech and Cornell around precision behavioral health. So now, without delay, let's get started. To kick off the panel, I'll hand it off to Professor Deborah Estrin. Deborah. Thank you, Thank you Tanzim, and it's uh, very exciting to be doing this with this great set of panelists. I'll be acting as a uh, moderator, and just to introduce myself, I'm a professor of computer science here at Cornell Tech, almost eight full years uh, since I moved from UCLA. And um, I do have a conflict of interest to mention. I'm uh, an Amazon scholar. And I've been very delighted to have an opportunity to work with uh, many of the people on the panel and look forward to uh, hearing more of what they have to say. So to start that off, uh, each of the panelists is going to introduce themselves and give a little bit of an introduction. And we're going to start off with uh, Derek Hall from Talkspace. Thanks, Deborah. Um, so as Deborah mentioned, I'm Derek Hall. I'm research director at Talkspace, um, which for those who aren't familiar with the company is a digital mental health network that connects credentialed licensed therapists with um, any individual really seeking care in all 50 of the United States. Um, and we do serve some areas internationally as well. Uh, so a little bit of background about me is that um, I've been in digital health since about 2008. I first got started with a computerized uh, cognitive behavioral therapy system. Um, and have worked on some other systems since then. Uh, as far as my relationship with Talkspace, I began there around 2016, uh, first as a research consultant and then was brought on to uh, lead research efforts full time. Um, and thankfully in the last several years, I would say that Talkspace has been uh, very fortunate to establish research partnerships with now dozens of academic institutions um, to investigate all aspects of the platform. <clears throat> um, uh, some of Talkspace's offering is very unique. Um, we blend more traditional approaches to psychotherapy with some innovative delivery methods. 
Um, and so we've been working with lots of people to research uh, that you know, particular type of delivery. Um, so to that end, the focus of my department over the last several years has been to evaluate the delivery model, which is asynchronous messaging, um, as well as some live video sessions. And we evaluate the model along, you know, traditional metrics that many of you may be familiar with, like symptom improvement for those using the system, changes in quality of life, treatment completion, patient satisfaction are some of the main outcomes uh, that we look at. Uh, in these research projects, we've published through peer-reviewed journals, um, and these data are often an important element in a lot of the due diligence processes of payers and employers uh, who consider, you know, who are considering Talkspace as a service for their constituents. Um, <clears throat> just by way of sort of introducing Talkspace's interest in this conference, um, one issue we've encountered, and a major reason that we're interested in precision tech in general, um, is there's a kind of difficulty in really understanding a patient well enough um, to individualize care from the very beginning of treatment. You know, there's often an onboarding process and we're always looking for efficiencies to assist the therapist um, and of course to assist the patient uh, in getting the most benefit from the treatment that they can get. Um, now, because we use live therapists, of course, our therapists are always tailoring care um, just as would happen in a face-to-face -face setting. But I think, you know, often in clinical practice, there's a delay between care, you know, the time that we deliver care or particular intervention, and then the feedback that we get um, from the patient on how well it's working for them. Do we need to shift tack? Are there other areas we should be focusing on? Uh, and this can make it difficult for clinicians to be as responsive and as flexible as they would like to be. Uh, so I think, you know, our big hope in this area and in partnering with researchers and other experts, many of whom are on this call and will be speaking to you today, um, is to try to improve our own analytics, um, our care delivery capabilities, and to assist our therapists and platform designers, and hopefully any future partners within this digital ecosystem um, to provide uh, high quality resources that maybe one day will no longer be considered a plan B or a plan C or plan D. Um, but that can offer quality treatment uh, for anyone for whom a digital experience uh, is a good fit. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Great. Uh, John, you're up next. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm John Kane. I'm professor and chairman of psychiatry at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine in Hempstead. I also serve as uh, senior vice president for behavioral health for the Northwell Health System. And um, you know, th this is an area that's of particular interest to us from a clinical and research perspective. As, as uh, Tanzim said, a tremendous proportion of the population suffers from some mental illness. And one of our biggest challenges is that most people who do experience a mental illness uh, do not receive a diagnosis or treatment for not just weeks or months, but years even in severe illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, the uh, delays in treatment are, are, quite, um, are quite extraordinary. And our concern about that revolves around the fact that the longer someone goes untreated, the greater the consequences of the illness can be in terms of vocational uh, adjustment, psychosocial adjustment, family burden, et cetera, et cetera. We have an enormous problem with the lack of mental health literacy amongst the population. Our hope is that digital technology can help us to address that. But we, we first started pursuing uh, some of these tools using natural language processing to look at social media postings by young people to see if we could identify early signs of mental illness. And uh, the answer to that was in fact we could. Um, we then began to do uh, Google pop-up ads in response to specific search terms, looking at uh, internet search histories as also a way to potentially identify early signs of illness. And we believe that digital technology can go a long way to helping us not only ascertain and engage people, but also to facilitate disease management. And by that, I mean the average patient is uh, seen weekly, monthly, bi-monthly by their mental health professional. And many of the uh, problems that can arise, such as a, a relapse or recurrence, will occur uh, in between those visits. 
And for many people, particularly those with uh, more severe illnesses, uh, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, there's often a loss of insight when those recurrences take place. And if we have ways of monitor monitoring people in real time and identifying anomalous behavior, we have an opportunity to intervene in such a way as to avoid a full-blown exacerbation or relapse, which might lead to a hospitalization, loss of a job, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're very excited about uh, the Precision Behavioral Health Initiative. We think it's extremely important that people from dis different disciplines work together to address this challenge. We often uh, find ourselves uh, in our own silos, and I think we, we have to we have to really have an interdisciplinary team to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. And um, so working with people uh, from different disciplines, from industry, and I, I should have said at the outset that I um, do consulting to almost all of the major pharmaceutical companies, particularly those developing antipsychotic drugs. I've been a consultant to Health Rhythms. And um, we're very excited about the opportunities here and obviously uh, also excited about the initiative that uh, Cornell Tech is launching. Thanks very much. Wonderful, John. You've been inspiring and educating us for so many years. We're very grateful. Uh, so, Mark, uh, your turn. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Matthews. I'm a researcher and I'm also an entrepreneur in digital mental health. I'm also a Cornell University alum who's had the pleasure of working with Deborah and Tanzine. Um, I've scarily been working in the area for over 15 years um, and I was just thinking today that I, I began my PhD back in 2003 and the focus was on using technology to help better measure and improve the treatment of mental health. Back then I was focused on dumb phones, this was before smartphones, and also using computer games to mediate psychotherapy. And today the picture really is pretty much the same, except we have a little bit better tools. We have a little bit more precise models. Um, today I'm here with two specific roles. So I'm a co-founder of Health Rhythms. I'm also the chief technology officer. The company is a digital mental health company. It's been around for over five years and we're focused on uh, precision mental health and using all of the data we can um, collect about someone with, with the person in order to help um, both identify earlier uh, if someone is nearing a relapse event and then also to use the information to help deliver precision mental health interventions. My second role is as an academic researcher where I focus on identifying exploratory and novel signals uh, that, that hopefully track mental health and then also to develop novel personalized interventions. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this initiative. I think you hear about precision on everything. You have precision agriculture, precision, precision t-shirts at this stage. It's, it's, you know, it's a term that's used a lot, but I think it's one where it particularly applies for mental health and um, you know, mental, mental illness really manifests itself in very in individual ways. And even going back to my PhD, the tool that I saw people using back then was a blunt instrument. It was a paper-based form. And in many, many cases, that is still the dominant um, instrument for measuring mental health. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to make a big difference there. And if we look at areas like education, online communication, and increasingly banking, we can see the, the benefit of uh, information if it's set free and accessible to, to people so that they can make use of it. And I think with mental health, we're going to see that in the next hopefully five to 10 years. Um, and I'm particularly excited about this initiative because as John alluded to, it's really um, the coming together of all the necessary components to make uh, a difference at scale. Um, I would add, for, in my work at least, the, the fourth major component in addition to the technologists, the clinicians and the, the companies are the people with mental illness themselves and their loved ones. And I think they're such an integral part of both developing the interventions and ensuring that they're um, acceptable at scale. Um, and so I'm, I'm really delighted to, to be on the panel and to hear um, all the conversation today. Great. And uh, now, David, I'd like you to take this forward. We've been talking about digital health, mobile health things since I think uh, 2010 when uh, we were just starting up OpenM Health. So 
look forward to your introductory remarks. Yeah, thanks, Deborah, and thanks, Tanzine, for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, just uh, before I get started, my conflicts of interest, I uh, have a, a, an equity interest in adaptive health, which is commercializing uh, some of the tools that we've developed and uh, also have consulted with a few pharmaceutical companies uh, as well as a few digital mental health companies. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, a, uh, I'm at Northwestern University where I direct the Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about that center in a moment. So, but I, I, I have been interested in, in remote treatment for mental health uh, for my entire academic career. And in fact, even in graduate school, I uh, started looking at delivering treatment via the telephone. And we did a lot of that work. It might surprise people to know that that uh, psychology was really resistant to the telephone. So uh, the use of the telephone. I mean, in this age of COVID, where everything's going to telemental health, in 1996, the the American Psychi Psychological Association issued a, a, a statement that therapists should not deliver psychotherapy via the telephone because it wasn't validated. This is more than a hundred years after the invention of the telephone. Uh, so. So we are, you know, when, when you talk to uh, psychologists, you're, you're talking to often a field that is um, very resistant to, to uh, change and, and innovation. But, uh, you know, I think John, uh, you know, John talked about, you know, the challenges that, that, that we face in delivering mental health care. I mean, 20% 20, 20 of, of the American population, at least, will have a mental health, a diagnosable mental health disorder in any given year. And, and far greater numbers will have sub-threshold symptoms that if treated early can prevent, uh, you know, the escalation into, uh, 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 into a, a diagnosable um, disorder. And yet the majority of people don't receive care. And when people do receive care, that care is usually inadequate. So we have, a, and th that has been a problem from the beginning of my career. And it really has not improved much, uh, you know, in, in, in my lifetime. And there are, there are lots of, of, of barriers to receiving mental health care. And some of them, you know, some of them are, you know, that, that they're, they're sort of uh, uh, attitudinal. Uh, so some people are skeptical of mental health professionals. Uh, there's, particularly in young people, young people often have a place a high value on self-reliance. Uh, and so they don't, they don't want to have help. But a lot of them, and the majority in our work has, has been their, their, the, the, the structural, um, that they, live, they don't live near a clinic. They have difficulty getting, getting access to appropriate treatment, uh, uh, transportation problems, time problems, uh, you know, not being able to fit it into their schedule. So there's a whole host of barriers that, that delivering remotely and now with technologies, we can potentially overcome. I mean, just to give you an example, 130 million Americans live in federally designated mental health shortage areas. Um, so, so it is not widely available. And, and even if we, if with telemental health rolling out now, which is, you know, delivering psychotherapy or, or consultations for, for, for uh, medications remotely, that may extend that, but we still will never have enough providers that, that to, to serve people. We, we, we have a chronic shortage of providers, you know, in, in most areas of the country. Um, so in, in 2011, we founded here at Northwestern the Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies. Uh, and we now have, you know, there are six faculty who are full time within that center. And then we work with a lot of other faculty in, uh, in, in Northwestern and in other universities. And over the past, what is that now, nine years, I guess, we've done a lot of intervention development, uh, a lot of clinical trials. And, and I think what we're moving to is, and a lot of what the focus of this uh, conference will be about is that, you know, I, I see that we have a, a big research to practice gap, um, that we have now hundreds and hundreds of randomized controlled trials showing that these things work and yet, they aren't getting implemented in, in the real world. And so um, a lot of the focus of our center now has shifted to try to understand and correct that, that problem. And I, I think we'll be talking more about that, but in a nutshell, I think the problems, these are not simple problems. Uh, you know, they are problems of design. They're problems that, that you know, of computer science. They're problems of, 
you know, related to, to clinical services, to integrating into organizations, integrating into our healthcare system. These, these, are, these are problems that really require uh, a, 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 a wide variety of disciplines working together to try to solve them. And so that's one of the, you know, that is one of the reasons that I'm really excited about this conference and about uh, working together with, with Precision Health. Uh, great. Yeah, came back from my audio. Yeah, it came back from my audio glitch um, smoothly somehow. So I will I will kind of start with uh, the first question, but uh, I want to first uh, um, uh, invite the audience members to participate. We will have um, audience questions at the end, but throughout the talk, um, if you have questions, use the Q&A option to submit your question. Someone is uh, monitoring it and we will visit it uh, um, um, towards the end of the uh, panel. So, and I want to also um, talk about my conflict um, along with uh, Mark Matthews. I was, I'm also a co-founder of Health Rhythms and now serve as its chief scientist. And um, I also um, have um, collaborated and have a working relationship with Talkspace in, in, in a research capacity. So I want to ask the first question, and this is for um, John and David. So we've heard a lot about the prevalence um, of mental health um, and the lack of treatment and care. One thing I want to also highlight is how it impacts communities disproportionately. So if we look at um, LGBTQ population, about 35% are impacted. If you look at our veteran population, about 40% um, have some kind of mental illness or substance use uh, disorder. In the current context, there are some studies that show there has been three-fold increase um, in mental health problems. Um, so we, we get these dire pictures. We often think about someone suffering from mental health as someone sitting in a corner, unable to do anything. Um, so my question to David and John, can you talk about some of the myths around mental illness? and behavioral health problems? Uh, John, you got, need to put your... You're muted. Sorry. Um, as, as you said, I think one of the myths is that mental illness is always severe and chronic and, and potentially incurable. And the reality is that most people who experience mental illness have much more mild or moderate disorders, but they can still interfere with people's functioning. So anxiety disorders, depression, OCD, things like that can, can be disabling for many people. So part of the challenge is to facilitate mental health literacy, to educate the public. You know, what is the difference between uh, everyday sadness or disappointment and a clinical depression? Um, we know that uh, anxiety serves a role in some of our performance, but it can be extreme and it can be incapacitating. So. That part of it is the challenge of education and then ensuring that people have access. And I think this is where some of the digital tools can play a very important role. We've seen certainly in the COVID pandemic, we've seen the fact that many people are able to connect with mental health services, but at the same time, many people are not. There are people who don't have access to telemedicine, who don't have smartphones, who don't have uh, you know internet connectivity. And we need to work with those people as well. So I think you know, crossing the digital divide is going to be another challenge for us, but a, a tremendous opportunity to reach uh, underserved populations. So I think one of our challenges is also, you know, as, as was suggested before, working with clinicians and patients to make sure that what we're doing is actually acceptable, useful, scalable, and sustainable. And that's uh, easier said than done. Yeah, I, I, I mean, John covered it pretty well. Um, I, I think there, the, but just to re reiterate, you know, there, there, I do most of my work is in common mental health problems like, uh, you know, depression and anxiety, and and I even hear clinicians talking about, you know, depression as the common cold of mental health disorders. Um, so, so you know, not only so even among clinicians, sometimes there's a there's there's at least messaging, if not, uh, you know, a, a sense that these are less important. And yet, 
they do have an enormous impact. So, so depression is in, in you know is is the largest cause of disability in 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 the United States and arguably in the world. And that's you know that's not of all health problems, cardiovascular everything. And that you know certainly having a heart attack is 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 probably more severe than most uh, what most people uh, experience with depression. But but the prevalence of of depression. And, and I will also say, you know, suicide is greatly increased with depression. So there are significant consequences, severe consequences to, to these, these disorders, although not as common. But the prevalence of it means as a society, you know, the, the common mental health problems have an enormous impact. Uh, you know, a few years ago, an economic report said that depression costs the American economy $200 billion a year and half, half of which is for, for treatment, and then the other half just in, in societal costs, uh, loss of work and, and those kinds of things. So they, they you know, this idea that it's, it's a, a, you know, not that important, you know, not that big a deal is, is, is really just not true. On top of that, you know, for the individual, you know, depression and anxiety, it causes, uh, you know, it causes, as, as John said, disruptions in the workplace, in relationships, and personal misery, you know, the, the, the misery that people have, the inability to live a, a life with, you know, some degree of quality and satisfaction is, is, is enormous. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the message is it's, it's important whether there, there are severe mental illnesses like psychotic disorders or, or um, you, know, you, you know, less severe but common uh, mental health problems. And if, if I could just well, thank you both. Thing, if thank I could just add one thing to what David said that you know we we also have to keep in mind that uh, he mentioned uh, you know having a heart attack as a sort of you know a health crisis but someone who has a heart attack and has a history of depression or has a depression after the heart attack is at much greater risk for a bad outcome like fatality than someone who doesn't have a depression so that's just one example we need to keep those things in mind as well sorry for the addition much appreciated. Um, uh, actually, I had a question uh, for David as a follow on to some of the things you said earlier. You know, I've wandered in as a technologist into working in mobile health. It's been a good 15 years. And I certainly thought from intuition, not based on anything scientific, that behavioral health would be one of the spaces where it would have its greatest quantitative impact in, or the earliest because of the opportunity to pick up signals that are otherwise lacking uh, explicit and, and quantitative measurements. And you referred to in your introductory remarks that there still is this big uh, gap between moving things into practice. So is there work that technologists can do to help with that uh, uh, you know, discovery to practice gap? Is it a non-technologist problem? Can you say a bit more? I think it's a problem. I think the problem is everywhere. Uh, there isn't, you know, like like any any big problem. There isn't there isn't one but, one. But wait, wait! I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you and show people that this is this is not a recorded webinar. <laughs> I know it's huge, but that makes it like daunting, and we can't get started. So yeah, yeah, tell yeah. me it's everywhere, but then give us some place to start. Well, let me give you. Let me just give you where sort of my sense of you know how you know very briefly how we've come to where we are and what we need to do. So. So, it, you know, you got into, and we've been talking for, for 10 years, um, it, but, y you know, I think most digital mental health tools were, you know, this started maybe 20 years ago as the internet became, started to become uh, kind of ubiquitous. And, and the psych psychologists saw this as an opportunity to deliver psychotherapy over the internet. And so, you know, we started building these programs that took you know, validated psychotherapy models like cognitive behavioral therapy and tried to put them on the internet. And initially, so, so typically these are kind of psychoeducational and maybe with some interactional features. And, and what we found initially was that nobody used it. Uh, so, so um, you, you know, and, and so what we did was we put, you know, some kind of human coaching in uh, to, to help support people. Um, and, and that, you know, indeed did, you know, increase the likelihood that people were going to stick with it. Um, and that model of delivering psychotherapy continue, you know, 
using the type technology to deliver psychotherapy uh, is, you know, continues today. I mean, you'll see all of these products out there. They are labeled as, you know, internet CBT or mobile CBT. It's, it's sort of framed in the context of psychotherapy. And I, I, I think that that is really limiting us. It's, it's kind of like a, you, you know, what's the term uh, in, in design, a skeuomorph. Right where uh, you 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 have something from the past, like like uh, like chandeliers. You know they'll have bulbs that are shaped like a candle. You know because it's nice. Um, but but here I think CBT is is limiting our ability to to think of things in new ways. Um, techno delivering a treatment over techno over tech via technology is not psychotherapy, and we should just let go of those. Of, of those assumptions and begin to, and the other, the other reason I think it's failed is that we failed to understand how people are interacting with their devices. You know, do people, what we've seen is that when people interact with apps and the apps that they want to interact with, they, they want to use it for 20 or 30 seconds, right? I mean, you, you know, aside from maybe reading the newspaper, uh, you know, or, a, or something that's intended to deliver content, people want help, they want to solve one problem, and they want to use an app to solve that one problem. And so, you, you know, what we've realized is we really need to do, you know, do a lot more work in design to understand what people want, what they need, how to fit it into the context of their lives, how, uh, you know, how to, to be able to nudge behavior in, in a direction. Maybe it's not psychotherapy, but we're moving people in, in the right direction um, in a way that is, can fit into the, into the fabric of their lives. Um, so so that so that's one place that we failed. We failed in organizations. So we see when these things get rolled out in organizations, they don't fit into the workflow. So we haven't even considered what organizations need. Uh, so we really need to understand what, what the providers need, how to fit it into their workflows. And nobody in healthcare is going to accept anything that doesn't help them with a problem they already have. So we need to solve a problem for them. And then how we fit it into the healthcare system more generally. Like, what is it that healthcare organizations need? What is it that our system needs in order to, to support these things? So it's a, it's a big problem. In terms of sensing, you know, I, which is kind of, I think, the focus of, of, of your group, I think that's also a huge challenge. Because when we see digital health tools that, work, that, that are, you know, people use, it, it, it's like, you know, step trackers. And that's a pretty, you know, if you're trying to increase your... And, it's debatable how many people use it, but let's just say that they do. Um, you, you know, that's a clear signal. And if you're trying to increase physical activity, we can get that and we can use it. But mental health, we don't have one target. We have how people think. We have how people, what, how people are interacting socially, you know, how they're sleeping. There's lots and lots of targets that are not necessarily easily detectable. Um, and so, so how do we begin to you know, what is it that we can detect? What is it that we can understand from a person's behavior or, or, you know, and be able to use it? We also, you know, anything we develop is going to have a huge amount of inaccuracy. So how do we represent inaccuracy to people in a way that's going to be acceptable? How do we understand what healthcare organizations, what need, and what can we collect and, and provide to them? So, you know, I think, you know, I think that th those are some of the challenges that we have in sensing that, that I think a collaboration could, could really, you know, move us forward on. Yeah, and in fact, your remarks, all of them indicate that we need much more interleaved design processes from start to finish. It's not just about you hand us some validated CBT and then say, figure it out how to make it engaging on a, on a phone. That's exactly what. So, John, uh, you've been trying to bridge this gap by launching a digital clinic that engages psychiatrists and behavioral scientists and technologists uh, together. So maybe you can uh, take a couple minutes and tell us more about that. Sure, absolutely. And as, as David emphasized, I think, you know, implementation is one of the challenges. Um, I think it, the reality is that any new clinical advance in medicine in general takes 10 to 15 years to actually get introduced to everyday clinical practice. So we have to think about some of the obstacles. I think that um, in our institution, for example, many clinicians have been very frustrated by the electronic medical record, which was promulgated as a way to make their lives easier. However, many of them feel it's made their lives more difficult. And I think this has colored their perception 
to the introduction of new technology. So we have to work, I think, very closely with the clinical teams to make sure that it fits into their workflow, that they see it as a positive addition to what we are offering and what they can provide to their patients. <coughs> that also means giving, providing some data to be able to show what kind of impact we can have on the conditions that we're treating. So we need to be, we need to be studying this from a number of different levels. And our, 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 our digital program is really intended to address some of these challenges, to work with clinicians and patients, understand what they want and need, what they consider to be sustainable. And as, as we know that, you know, patients will download an app and not be using it two weeks later. It's a, it's a real challenge to facilitate sustainability. So we're, we're trying to, you know, uh, we're doing surveys of both patients and clinicians to try to gain a better insight into their understanding of what um, precision behavioral health, for example, has to offer them. And then to understand what they see as the obstacles, you know, and how can we help them overcome those obstacles. But in addition, we're trying to bring to bear an array of tools. So natural language processing, uh, mobile sensing, but also analysis of, of voice, speech, uh, and facial movements to help both in the diagnostic process, but also in terms of disease management. You know, what can we do to pick up early signs of relapse? Uh, we're beginning to think about virtual reality as another potential tool. And the hope, the hope is that we can integrate these tools in a way that's seamless and to provide both the patients and the clinicians an array of options to choose from. And some of this may be sequential, but as, as Mark emphasized in his remarks, it has to be personalized and it has to be done um, in conjunction with shared decision-making and understanding the patient's goals, what they want to achieve, and, and you know, looking, looking for wins, looking for situations where we can demonstrate the, the actual benefit. Thanks, John. So uh, moving to Mark. Um, so as you mentioned, that um, you've been working over a decade with patients and their family members who are struggling with mental health issues, starting from the very young and, and the older adults. And, and thinking really deeply about solutions that are sensitive to their needs and, and their mental health state. So, do we need to think beyond individuals as we design these solutions? And how do we bring in family members and their loved ones? And you had said that your first solution was a game. So is gamification the answer? So uh, yes, gamification is the answer to everything in, in life. Um, let me answer it a little bit more honestly. So first of all, I'd say that it's important to recognize that software is one component, and I would say it's not even a necessary component for improved mental health. Of course, if we want to make treatment available at scale, if we want to help find these very complex individual signatures, then it is a necessary one. And we can think then of gamification to go along with your joke as one potential component, a design element, again, it's not a necessary one in an intervention. Um, and I, I should define gamification because I think it's always something that's uh, implicitly defined, but in my brain, it's uh, using game design elements, things like rewards, badges, feedback, outside of a, a, a game context. So in terms of something like gamification, I think it's interesting. It's been, there's been a lot of focus in the tech uh, design field. Um, in terms of trying to use it to affect uh, engagement, motivation in interventions. And, you know, the, the, it's certainly shown some benefits in things like physical activity and chronic disease management, although, you know, it's still nascent. And then within mental health, it's been explored. Um, I think I, I've, I'm familiar with about 20 to 30 different uh, studies that have, or systems that have used gamification. But there are very few that try to isolate, you know, these individual elements to use active ingredients, if you, if you will, in terms of um, digital interventions. And I think that's one really interesting area for um, a, a partnership like this is to work with, with patients and clinicians and family members to both 
uh, explore potential new inter um, innovations from an interactive perspective, from a user experience perspective, but also as a way of bubbling up things. I often find when you work with um, patients and you work with the families uh, and loved ones that they found, sometimes they come up with really interesting ways of dealing with something that hasn't come, it's not a top-down solution, but it's something that they found has worked for them. And I think that's a really interesting pipeline for identifying novel ways of um, developing solutions or protective software uh, for people. In my work at Cornell, actually, we use gamification in bipolar disorder, um, where it actually made a, a good bit of sense and we published on it and we found that it had a, a, a little bit of a, an ef a positive effect in terms of engaging people in their weekly management of their condition. But again, I, you know, gamification is just one tool. Um, I think to get more to, towards the serious uh, side of, of your question uh, regarding the individual, I feel like a lot of software that we have, both in the consumer side and also on the academic side, is really focused on, on the individual and this idea of behavior change. And I think, you know, as David mentioned, we need to really recognize that mental illness is extremely complex. There's multiple factors, multiple mechanisms that influence the, the manifestation of mental illness. And, you know, in the real world, um, you know, we're not, we're not like, we're not trying to develop a Netflix. We're not trying to optimize for, for engagement. We're trying to optimize for, for positive outcomes and mental health. Um, and so I think any solution that, that we're, that we're going to think about developing needs to be grounded in and around the human. And I say the human as opposed to the patient, because I don't think anyone really wants to or actually thinks of themselves as a patient. So we think around the human and then, um, then you go out, outside the human to loved ones, to family members, to peer groups, to the community, to the society. And I think you need to really think about technology at that level, at all those different layers. And uh, I actually use a framework from Yuri Bronfenbrenner, uh, who was at Cornell as well, actually, who has an ecological systems theory, um, which is basically just looking at the individual as one component in a very complex um, social structure. And my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Murnane and Jamie Snyder uh, at University of Washington in Dartmouth have actually done really good work on looking at how do you develop personal informatics systems that can uh, scale and work across individuals, uh, specifically there for bipolar disorder. Um, but I'd finish, I mean, I think it's obviously so complex, there's no easy solution when it comes to developing software or integrating technology in the treatment of mental illness. But three things that I typically use when I'm approaching this is, first of all, as I've emphasized already, I might be sounding like a, a broken record, but it's to try and get the process right. So working from the ground up with a deep clinical understanding of the condition that you're designing for, involve clinicians, involve people with the condition as co-designers. So not just people who you might solicit feedback from occasionally, but they can actually live with the basic version of what you're trying to build and uh, give you feedback. And it can evolve uh, in the real world and that you can really factor in their sense of agency and personhood in the technology that you're trying to develop. I'd also, from the commercial side, we hear a lot about um, you know, engagement. And again, it's this, it feels like we've taken this um, model from consumer technology and we're trying to magnetize everyone to our software. And I think we're, you know, again, we know we're not optimizing for engagement. So software doesn't need to make itself shown. Uh, it, it can be there in the background. And uh, I think the key thing is that people trust it. They feel they have a sense of agency over it. And thirdly, I think that they feel like they're getting some value from it. Um, in my academic work, I suppose, in terms of moving away from behavior change, I've focused a lot more on invisible interventions, specifically in your environment, in your home environment, and how you can adjust them to promote positive mental health. And then with health rhythms, we've really focused on um, trying to amplify the therapeutic relationship between a, another human and whoever's receiving treatment. Um, and you know, that's where I think the, a lot of the work that we've spoken about so far today can really make an impact in, in being able to scale uh, the treatments that are available. Thank you, Mark. Um, so you emphasize quite a lot about kind of this iterative design and building of technology and solution with, with the human in mind. So let's, um, I want to move on to Derek, um, because um, Talkspace to some extent has been very successful. 
it has made behavioral therapy accessible to more than a million users. So that's, that's really huge. Um, and Talkspace also has a great track record of academic collaborations. So what gaps do you think still exist um, to make mental health care accessible and affordable? And where do you think the role of physician technology, where do we need to really hone it? Um, so many areas, <laughs> so many, so many. I'm sure we could all list, you know, dozens and dozens of areas. So I'm going to try not to do that, although I do have some high, you know, some high level things. Um, I think the first place to start from my perspective is, uh, you know, as others have said, John and David, um, you know, what we're really confronting here are system level issues. And in a way to solve system level issues, you almost have to create a replacement system. It's not so easy to tinker your way to um, improvement within a large system that already has, you know, decades behind it, um, that has particular types of incentives that interacts with policy and regulators in particular types of ways. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the opportunities that's been created through Talkspace is the creation of a system like that. So it isn't just a tech platform, it's also a credentialed licensed therapist network. It's also a recruitment channel and PR spots and people who are willing to talk about their mental health to destigmatize de seeking treatment in the first place. So it's really, you know, in a way, Talkspace is a system that's designed to try to solve um, some of these problems from beginning to end and provide, you know, high quality care along the way. Um, but even with that, we still encounter uh, a lot of barriers. Certainly, <clears throat> one of the things that we've tried to work on is delay to care. Um, you know, as John mentioned and David mentioned, uh, the lack of providers is a significant issue. So we need to find ways to make providers more efficient. Platforms can help do that. Um, Talkspace has had some success there in helping providers be more efficient. Um, you know, the other big one, actually, I'm not going to go through this list, uh, even though there's others language, there's language barriers, you know, and a lot of NLP and a lot of platforms assume that everybody speaks English, not everybody speaks English as a first language. Um, tech access that John mentioned, integrating these platforms in a larger ecosystem, you know, these are sort of the system level issues that we need to focus on. Uh, but for our purposes here, I think another important one is this research to practice gap, which is that um, the it's the way that time has counted between the two areas is one major barrier. So research is slow and deliberate and careful, which is wonderful. Um, startups and people trying to create new systems and new access, you know, new types of access to care uh, have to move more quickly. Um, we're trying to find a way, and I think Talkspace has had some success in trying to sync those up so that both are moving uh, in conjunction with each other. Um, and I think the other piece, and this will be the last thing, you know, the last thing I'll say, um, so we have time for some questions, um, is being willing to experiment by offering, uh, you know, user design technology straight to, you know, the user, in this case, a client or, or a human. I like the way that Mark put that. Um, and being willing to experiment because there's a lot of things that work well in a lab setting or that work with all the structures um, that go into that. In fact, John published a really great paper that we think about a lot at Talkspace, which is that when you offer people incentives to participate in your study, you're already destroying any sort of external validity <laughs> to, the, to the system because people are going to participate more if you're paying them to participate. But in the real world, we don't pay people to participate. They pay us for care. Um, and so the willingness to experiment, put some technology out there, um, have you know, people seeking care, interact with it, learn from them and sort of adapt what was discovered in the lab and what's discovered through surveys to actual user experience, um, I think is a, you know, really big opportunity here, particularly for precision tech as we're trying to adapt to individuals, um, you know, at that level of granularity. Thank you. Sir. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. I just want to make sure we can get to a few questions from the audience. And uh, I'll, we'll do a little bit of that. And I encourage all of you to interject more questions or reinterject one of those questions during the presentations uh, that are coming up in just a few minutes. So uh, first for John, I wondered if you could sort of do a, a combination answer to a couple of questions. One from Nidhi uh, asking, how do we overcome the barriers that providers have in adopting digital health 
because they think that the technology and they experience the technology as taking away from the human side of care. That's part A. And part B is one of the challenges of mental health, and you alluded to this, is uh, actually it hindering uh, self-efficacy uh, and, and self-knowledge, and are there strategies for engagement that you've been addressing uh, there? So a two-part question to John. Yeah, so I, th I think one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the myths about, uh, I think, technology is that it, it does um, eliminate the human side of things. I mean, we view it as really an, an extension of our ability to interact with patients, uh, particularly in real time. So as David emphasized, we don't have enough mental health professionals to be there, you know, for everyone whenever they're needed. So we need to be able to to find ways to facilitate engagement and outreach and, and as disease management. So it really is an extension, in my view, of the relationship with the mental health providers to make it more accurate, more efficient, and, and more scalable. And the same thing applies to the sort of self-autonomy, that we're not, we're not trying to uh, manage people's um, diseases. We're really trying to manage their, their, we're trying to help them manage their diseases. So it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort and the patient has tremendous autonomy in that effort. And I think, you know, we need to sustain that. As, as David said, you know, we've, we've both been using uh, sort of health technology coaches and that, that can also add a human element. So people may not be familiar with the technology. They may be frustrated if they can't do X, Y, or Z with a particular tool. So you do need, I think, a human being to be there to help them to monitor their use, to, to talk to them about problems they're having. So I think we can address the two issues that you raised. Deborah, your audio is gone, so I will take over. Um, and so the last question I think was, uh, I will answer uh, what's <clears throat> from Aware Health about what are some ways to collaborate with precision behavioral health. Um, I invite, you to email us. We, if you go to our webpage, pbh.tech.cornell.edu, there's a contact email. Um, we are forming a consortium around our precision behavioral health initiative. So we'd love to talk more. Um, and I know that there are other questions uh, on the Q&A, which uh, some of it we will try to um, answer during the talks. The panelists, I invite the panelists to look at the questions and see if they would uh, are able to answer some of them um, by text. I also encourage you, some of it would be very relevant um, in context of the talks that you're about to hear. So please ask them again um, during the talks because I think there are some very important questions about, about patients, about bias, which we don't want to miss. So with that, um, I want to thank all the panelists for, for your time and um, your very thoughtful um, responses and, and most importantly, really joining us in this journey and, and bringing your perspective and expertise in, in making precision behavioral health technology a, a reality that can be grounded with um, clinicians and patients in mind. So with that, um, I, will, I would like to um, uh, hand off to our first speaker. So now you will hear um, a little bit more about the, the research and the projects that are going on under this initiative. Um, and um, the very first speaker is one of our newest um, professors at Cornell Tech, it's Professor Raja Lakshmi Nandakumar, who's going to talk about the work that she's been doing in opioid overdose detection using smartphones. Raja Lakshmi. Thanks, Tanzim. Thanks for the intro. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Tanzim mentioned, I'm Raj Rakshmi Nandakumar. And if you want to reach out, please uh, reach out in my Cornell email ID. OK, uh, so today I'm going to talk about our work, uh, some of our work and directions in the substance addiction space. Uh, specifically, today I want to talk about our work in detecting opioid overdoses using smartphones. Now, opioid overdose is one of the serious public health epidemic in the United States today. In fact, it is actually a leading cause of death for people below age 50 
even more than the road accidents. And if you look at some of the stats in 2017, it's about like 49,000 deaths. And this has only increased more in, in this kind of like a, a pandemic situation where people are confined to their homes. Now, one of the good news is that unlike other life-threatening medical conditions, 93% of the opioid overdose deaths can be prevented by administering this antidote called naloxone and giving some respiratory care in, in a timely manner to the, to the patient. But stats show that today, only 6% of the overdose victims actually receive this naloxone or any respiratory care. This is because most of the opioid overdose victims either die alone or are in the presence of people who couldn't detect this overdose event. So this shows that there is clearly a need for detecting an overdose event and then in a, in a timely manner so that you could actually like connect them to life-saving interventions like it could be either 911 or even just a friend or a neighbor with an antidote. So what we proposed, so let's, let's start with like what happens during an opioid overdose, right? Um, let's consider the situation where people, have, people are taking the illicitly obtained opioids and then they inject them in the body, right? And once they actually like inject this opioid, their brain activity slows down and then it first prevents them from taking breaths. So there is actually a decrease in the respiration rate and this decrease in the respiration rate slowly causes their oxygen saturation level to go down. And then once the oxygen saturation level goes down beyond a particular limit, then you, uh, they actually like, um, they, they experience a cardiac arrest and within a few minutes, they actually die. So if you look at this uh, trajectory, we can see that if you're able to detect the opioid overdose at the early time, that is when there is a decrease in the respiration of the person or when they stop breathing itself, then you would have actually like enough time for a response to arrive in a timely manner and intervene and actually like save the person. So that's what we targeted. We built this system called Second Chance, which is a smartphone based system where let's say the person is actually like placing their smartphone, the person who's actually engaging this high risk behavior, they're actually like placing a smartphone somewhere in front of them, let's say in a table within a meter around them. Now this smartphone has the second chance app and it's going to track their uh, breathing motion, breathing chest motion using an active sonar technology. And then it would actually like send out an alarm or it basically detects this breathing precursors and sees when this breathing uh, rate goes down or if they stop breathing and it can intervene in a timely manner. Now, the reason we chose the smartphone platform is that I, a study shows that 94% of the illicit opioid users actually own a smartphone today. So as I said, the app actually monitors the respiration of a person using this technique called active sonar. So, what is active sonar is like you could, uh, uh, most of us would have seen this Batman movie where they use inaudible sound signals to actually map out the entire city in the smartphone using smartphones, right? So the concept is very similar. What we do is we send out inaudible sound signals using the phone's smartphone. These signals would get reflected off the person's chest and then these reflections would be recorded by the phone's microphone. Now, when the person is actually breathing, there's going to be a slight change in the position of their chest and the abdomen, right? This in turn would actually change the reflection of these inaudible sound waves as well. So if you're actually like processing these sound waves that are received by the microphone, we would be able to get this minute breathing motion in a millimeter level resolution. Now, this solution is very compelling because of two reasons. One, is that we could see that there is, if, if we see the trend, there is actually an increasing number of speakers and microphones that are around us, right? Like phones started with one or two microphones, your, and our latest iPhone has three microphones. And if we look at devices like home assistants, 
um, Amazon uh, Alexa or a Google Home has seven to eight microphones. And nowadays, even the headsets or like the TVs, TVs use actually like the speakers and microphones and this sonar technology to actually detect the distance of the person. So this, so there is actually this increasing trend of speakers and microphones, which we could very well utilize. The second thing is that these off the shelf speakers and microphones that are available in the devices have a high sampling rate of 48 kilohertz, which in itself is sufficient to get a millimeter level resolution. So you don't need like an improved hardware, rather the hardware is already available in these existing devices. So what we did was we transformed the smartphone and then we actually like use this technique to detect the breathing of the person. And using this, we, when we are detecting events when the person stops breathing and then eventually intervene when they are experiencing the overdose event. So in order to test this entire system, we wanted to do a testing in, we want to test our system in a real world scenario in a real, uh, uh, the high risk behavior use. So in order to do that, we went to this facility called Insight, which is a supervised injection facility in Vancouver, British Columbia in, in Canada. So this is actually a government funded facility where people bring illicitly obtained drugs and they take it in the presence of medical supervisors. So here is a short video, publicly available video of what happens in the inside. It contains a little bit of graphic content. This is my warning ahead. Um, so a person enters this inside facility. It runs for 18 hours and sometimes 24 hours a day. And then this is the room where they have like different booths. So people actually like bring their own drugs, but then they're provided those safe needles and other tourniquets and everything that they needed in the facility. And they occupy one of the booths and then they take it in the presence. So this booth uh, also has medical professionals who are actually like constantly moving around the room and just looking at the people. And then if they feel that a person has overdosed, then they go approach the person and then test. And then if they needed help, they administer the naloxone and call 911. Okay, so this is the, the place that we went to. And what we did was when people were engaging in this high risk behavior, we tested our efficiency of our system in detecting the overdose events. And here is the protocol that we followed. So in the overdose facility, in, this, in the injection facility, we actually recruited 209 patients. And then we asked them to actually like wear a respiration belt across the chest as like a ground truth. And then we also placed our sm uh, smartphone in front of them in the booth itself in order to monitor their respiration. And here is the protocol. So if you look at like what happens in this, in this process is that people actually like come to the facility, they, they occupy the booth, and then they take about like five to 10 minutes just to prepare the drug. That is, they'll have to like powder it, they add water, they have to like fill the syringe, find the vein. There is, there is a quite a bit of process, following which what we do is once the process gets over, we actually monitor their breathing for a period of one minute. And then, we ask them to continue injecting the opioid. Following the post-injection, we monitor them for a period of five minutes. The, uh, the reason we chose five minutes is that most of the opioids have like a reaction time within five minutes. That is, anything happens with the, within that duration. And in that post-injection period, we look for apnea events. The apnea events are durations where the person stops breathing for at least 10 seconds. So here is the accuracy of our system in detecting the cessation of breathing events. So our app had a sensitivity of about 96% and a specificity of about 98%, which is actually very high. So we were, be, we were able to efficiently discover when the per person's respiration decreases and in fact, when the person's respiration stops. So can we actually use this system as such? So the question would be, when, let's say they stop breathing for 10 seconds, should I call 911 now, right? So when do I intervene? Now, in order to answer this question, we looked at the histogram of the duration of all this uh, cessation of breathing events. And there were multiple interesting points to note here. The first thing is, among the 200 people, 
there were two people who actually like went into the overdose kit and they actually required the naloxone antidote and the 911 respiratory care in order to revive them. Okay. And of the other rest of the people, 52% of the people had at least one cessation event. And among these uh, people, 80% of the people had at least 30 seconds events. But then at the after like 30 seconds or 30 seconds, they just woke up automatically. There was no intervention or anything. It was like just that the patient actually like woke up. Now, one of the main reasons for this is because that uh, the it is it is because of the environment of the inside facility itself. In inside, what they do is they continuously play music in speakers in the room. So what happens is the external sound actually acts as a stimuli to wake up this person, and this in turn reduces the overdose number of overdose events as well. So that's why in most of the cases, even when the person stops breathing, then they have this stimuli and then they just wake up, right? So one thing which we learned from here is that if, you're, if we, we cannot just call 911 every time a person stops breathing for like 10 seconds or even kind of like 30 seconds, right? Because they could automatically wake up and then you would just end up with a whole number of like false positive events and then your 911 would be clogged. So essentially what we need is actually a multi-tier interactive system. So what we did was that if we first look at the, the respiration of the person, and if they stop breathing for at least a period of 30 seconds, we first send out an audible alarm, just similar to the, uh, the, the inside facilities environment, you would just send out a, wide, uh, the, a loud alarm. And if, you're, if the person wakes up because of the stimuli, and if they respond to the smartphone saying that they're okay, then you can de-escalate the alarm. Otherwise, you know that the patient, the patient is in some problem. So we actually like escalate the alarm and then we make some intervention such as either calling, a, it, it would be a preset intervention as either calling 911 or calling a specific friend or a family member. So this is how this opioid overdose system actually works. Now, the next question would be, Okay, so we, what I showed now is actually like a harm reduction system, right? We detect an opioid overdose event after it happens, and we try to help give the person a second chance in order to go to the next step. But the question now we are trying to ask is that, can we actually like go ahead, take a step ahead, and then go at a step early in the cycle? The question is, can we actually detect craving and intake of a substance when it's happening itself and intervene at the right time in order to even prevent an overdose, right? Instead of like intervening like after an overdose is happening. And more recently, we have been trying to answer this question. And uh, the, the way we are trying to approach this problem is we have a set of smart devices that are around us with like sensors that could detect the physiological signals of a person. Like we can detect the breathing, uh, we can detect the heart rate. We, sh we showed that we could use the smartphone to detect breathing, activity, location. We, could, we can use the heart rate sensors in the watches. So can we integrate these sensor data, the physiological signal data, and also build our own new smart sensors that could actually detect additional data that could that could uh, help in detecting the craving for a substance. For example, um, studies have shown that uh, when a person is actually experiencing an alcohol withdrawal an, or an opioid withdrawal, they tend to have goosebumps. So can we actually use custom optical smart sensors in order to detect these new physiological signals? And if we can integrate these sensors together and build a physiological signal-based uh, system, that could actually like detect craving and the substance intake, then we could help manage the substance addiction of a person in a more efficient manner. So that is actually the project that we are working now. And this has like different parts which are open-ended questions as to like, how are we going to integrate them? What would be the new sensors? How to make it in like a, a smartwatch or a wearable form factor or like a device that you could place in, in a room and then how to do all this in a privacy preserving manner. So there are lots of challenges ahead and I would love to hear from, uh, hear your thoughts or ideas from anyone in the group here. Uh, with that, I'll end the talk and I'm open to questions. 
Great, thank you so much for the talk. So we do have a couple questions from the audiences and then to save time, I will do a short question, so which has a lot more of a broader implication. So how do these people who have opiates overdose concerns feel about having a remote uh, monitoring application? Are they concerned about being tracked or is this form factor something that they are familiar with to um, monitor their symptoms? Mon monitor. Uh, that's a great question. So the first thing when I went and recruited people, the first thing they asked is, is it like, is, is the camera on, right? They don't want to be recorded in, in, a, in front of a camera. But then the good thing about this particular app is that it only sends inaudible sound signals and it's only looking at the reflections of these inaudible sound signals. So nothing like audio speech or their face or anything about uh, the environment is actually like recorded. So in, in a sense, this app runs in a privacy preserving manner. And the other thing is all the processing happens in the phone itself. The, none of the data is actually sent to any server. And that, uh, so that is actually also important in, 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 in ensuring that people actually like want to use this app. Uh, the second thing is that people really wanted to use this app um, to actually like get help from their neighbors or their family members. We, when we did a survey of whether they would use this app, they said that, sure, we would use it, but I don't want you to call 911 or report to 911. Um, I just want, uh, I, I will use it if you just, if it would just automatically call my family member. So those are the two things that we were working on. And that's why we kind of like moved from uh, 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 the 911 setup to actually like using a phone, uh, uh, contacting a friend or a family member. Great, thank you so much for the talk. And if audiences have further questions, feel free to ask Raja directly. And now in time to do, I will welcome Justin Zhang to give her talk. All right, um, let me just share my screen. Um, can everyone see and hear me okay? I'm assuming no one's complained, so I'll go ahead. All right, so I'm Justine, and I develop computational methods for studying conversations. And so by applying these computational tools to analyze large data sets of conversations, what I hope to do in collaboration with my advisor, Chris John, who you heard earlier, is contribute to a better understanding of what makes conversations um, interesting, challenging, and valuable for the people who have them. And this has important implications for healthcare related applications as Christian has talked about because there's many situations where being able to have good conversations could be extremely valuable. So to take a banal example that's close to home for many of us, I have conversations with my advisor and collaborator Christian every week and my ability to make any progress on my PhD is closely tied to his ability to have a good advising conversation so no pressure there. Um, and another example it, you might have experienced is doctors talking with patients. So um, imagine getting a better handle on a medical condition, uh, unpacking a treatment, or breaking news about a diagnosis. And something you might have heard about in the news more recently is contact tracing. And so there's people who basically wake up every day and talk to other people, so perhaps nervous, scared, or skeptical people, um, in order to figure out whether they've been in close proximity to someone uh, with a contagious disease. So one through line in all of these examples, among many others, is that having conversations is a central part of how these various social support systems work. Now, another through line is that these conversationalists who have these difficult conversations every day, um, they often have rich intuitions about what makes conversations click or not click. So for instance, we can look at these intuitions as encoded in training programs for contact tracers, or you can think about the notion of a doctor having a good bedside manner. Um, so our goal as computer scientists is to develop ways to describe and shed light on these intuitions in ways that are helpful to the conversationalists. And so to give you a better sense of what I mean, I want to dig into a particular conversational setting, which is um, crisis counseling. And so for the past few years, um, I was working with Christian and this platform um, Crisis Text Line, which is over 1.5 million anonymized conversations that we were able to analyze. And the premise is that when people are in mental distress, they can text into the platform and get connected with a counselor. 
And so over the course of this text message conversation, the counselor tries to guide this individual or um, this texter to a calmer state where they're better able to cope with their situation. And so this service is specifically directed towards dealing with helping people through acute moments of crisis. So it's a similar space, albeit uh, different in its crucial way from the longer term talk therapy that some of the panelists were talking about earlier. And these textures are coming in with problems ranging from um, anxiety to depression to suicidal ideation. And the counselor has to find a way to build this connection over the course of a conversation with these total strangers. So obviously this is a really hard job. And what makes it really interesting and promising is that these counselors are actually volunteers. And so they might have a lot of intuitions about how to have good conversations, but they likely need some guidance to channel these intuitions into this very specific and high stakes task. And I guess like I, I sort of appreciate these difficulties as well because I went through the same training program that the platform provides for its counselors and took some conversations as well. And so one among many challenges that stuck out to me as particularly salient um, and that also were salient to the platform staff um, is something that we explored in greater detail. And so the crux of this challenge is that at a high level, of course, you as a counselor want to help this texter. But in the course of doing that, there's multiple objectives you want to enact and hold in balance. So first, um, you want to advance this conversation forwards from a hot moment to a state of cool calm where this individual is better equipped to cope. So for instance, if someone's frustrated that their parents aren't taking their problems seriously, you might ask if they've confided to anyone else um, and maybe nudge them towards thinking of other support systems. Now, beyond helping the texter advance forwards, you're also here to simply listen and better understand what's going on. And by looking backwards in the conversation and addressing what the texter says, you're showing that you're taking them seriously and that you empathetically appreciate the sense of frustration. Now, balancing these objectives can be hard and where you land between them can have consequences. So for instance, if you're too focused on advancing forwards, you could rush the conversation and short circuit the process of establishing an empathetic connection. Whereas if you're too focused on looking backwards, then you could stall the conversation. And at some point, maybe it's even the case that circling through the same distressing frustrations becomes somewhat detrimental. Now, many of you have probably experienced some version of this difficulty in your own conversations, but you can imagine how high the stakes are for getting this right in counseling. And so one contribution we as natural language processing researchers can make um, it's to somehow make all of this a bit more precise and come up with a computational lens that highlights this balancing challenge. And it allows us to analyze how people strike this balance and perhaps eventually offer some data-driven guidance to these counselors. And so what we did was we developed a way to model the extent which at every turn in a conversation, a counselor is more focused on advancing forwards versus addressing backwards. So you can think of where they land as a point along this axis. And we developed a measure, a method to measure this quantity. Um, and it makes use of some linear algebra that we detail in this paper, which I encourage you to check out. Um, we presented it at the ACL conference earlier this year. Now, I just wanna draw out one point from this paper, which is one thing you can do now that you have this measure and this way of analyzing a lot of conversation data is you can more rigorously ask this question of, well, is a particular behavior going to be more or less effective? That is, is it actually going to be helpful or not to the texter? And so one of our findings is that in conversations which were rated as helpful um, in a post-conversation survey, uh, counselors tended to be more backwards oriented. That is more focused on addressing rather than advancing forwards. Now this is actually in line with a lot of offline work in psychology emphasizing the importance of establishing this type of empathy. But it's interesting and potentially generative that we can see this at a large scale and put a number to it. And so what we hope in particular this understanding might give us is data-driven policies that the platform could implement to help these counselors. So for instance, you can imagine informing ways to better train them or to give them support in the middle of an, a running active conversation. And these are all things that the folks at Crisis Text Line have expressed some interest in. Now, of course, we can perform a lot more sophisticated analyses now that we have this tool. And so one thing that we're actually working on right now is coming up with more intricate models of conversations. 
And a key guiding principle behind this work is to work with platforms like Crisis Text Line to get a sense of what's salient or what matters for the conversationalists like these counselors who are actually experiencing these interactions. But of course, there's a lot of other research directions we've been looking at as well, because if you think about it, um, there's a lot of ingredients that go into informing something that a platform like Crisis Text Line can do. Um, and this entire research agenda is both scientifically interesting to us and critically important to get right. So for instance, uh, and this is something that Chris John alluded to earlier, it seems intuitive that you would only train counselors to adopt a behavior if you knew it resulted in a good outcome. But the old adage that correlation doesn't imply causation definitely applies here. And disentangling cause from correlation turns out to be especially difficult in conversations where your behavior is so closely tied to what the other person does and the context of the interaction. So just to pick a very simple behavior, uh, one thing we find is that in conversations rated as helpful, counselors are more likely to say, you're welcome. That correlation might motivate us to encourage counselors to say, you're welcome more often. Um, but if we pause and think about it, it might be that you're welcome doesn't cause a good conversation. It's a natural response to thank you and a signal that the conversation is already going well. And so we have a paper that presents a theoretical framework for thinking about these challenges. And as we think more deeply about what types of policies or interventions we might want to inform, we're continuing to build up this causal inference machinery. And the last thing to note is that these counselors take many conversations throughout their service. And if you look at this longitudinal view and think about how they might learn from experience or uh, how they might get fatigued from taking so many conversations over time, this can shed light on other ways to help them out throughout their career. And so we take a look, for instance, at how they linguistically develop. And so we're continuing to work in all of these directions, and I encourage you to check out our existing papers if you're interested. Um, and what's exciting for me in the space is that it's really rewarding to explore the links between conversations and public health and to work with people in these domains to illustrate what's relevant to their intuitions and experiences. It certainly adds a lot of weight to this question of what it means to have a good conversation. All right. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Um, thank you, Justine. Um... We have a question uh, from the audience. So how do these tools mention the cultural variance in conversation? Um, for instance, the phrase on uh, tell me about it can be a request for information or an affirmation. Uh, how do you mention the cultural, cultural and the linguistic complexity here? That's a question we got from the audience. Right, I think, yeah, that's definitely a really interesting question. And I guess like it's especially salient to counselors who who might have some difficulty like engaging with people who don't necessarily have the same common grounding as them. Um, I guess like this is this is an area that we're further that we're continuing to work on. Um, I think that um, one, I guess like two two answers to this. One is to one is like we can adapt these tools to like account for what different cultural groups and different concerns the texters bring to their conversations are like how these vary across these different concerns. Um, and I guess the other answer is to, I think, I think the best approach is honestly to pay attention to what counselors and what these texters think of as like salient points of cultural variation. So, um, you know, like how like different situations that they imagine are different or can result in like a different interpretation of a phrase. Um, I mean, I think, so in short, it's definitely an interesting question and it's something that we're thinking more about, especially since NLP could be expanded in general to account for these cultural variations. Thank you, Justine. Okay, let's move, move on to our next talk. Uh, let's welcome our next speaker, Dan. Great, thanks, Vincent. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, great. Um, does everyone see? I'll wait to see whether silence occurs. All right, silence means I think I'm good to go. Um, so thank you all. Uh, my name's Dan, I'm a graduate student at Cornell Tech and I'm gonna be talking about um, some of the recent work we've done on predicting relapse 
uh, in schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And I thought it would be good just to start by giving a little bit of a background about myself um, and my research interests. Uh, I am particularly interested in adapting novel uh, algorithms and in artificial intelligence, uh, specifically for mental and behavioral health. And even more specifically, most of the work I've done is about symptom monitoring of mental and behavioral health conditions. Um, and I also look at the implications of adapting these tools, uh, including the interpretability, ethics, and privacy. And I am advised by Tanzine. And before getting into the work, uh, I just wanted to give a brief mention to our collaborators, um, of which there are many across the country at the University of Washington, Northwell Health, Dartmouth, and of course here at Cornell Tech. So I thought I would start this talk by just highlighting a little bit about the types of changes that individuals might experience preceding a major psychiatric event. So I have up here uh, a couple of symptoms of depression that are on what we call the Patient Health Questionnaire 9, which is actually a self-assessment that individuals utilize to measure their depression symptoms. And it is sort of the main tool that's actually utilized to measure symptoms of depression. And as you see, these symptoms are quite involved with behavior changes that recently happened to an individual, including psychomotor changes, pleasure changes, and changes in sleep. So here's another condition, which is schizophrenia, which is the main condition that I'll be talking about for the rest of this work. Um, and schizophrenia is measured quite differently. It's rated by something we call the Brief Psychiatric Rating Scale, or BPRS. And it's actually administered by a clinician. A clinician interviews a patient. But similarly to depression, uh, it involves ranking behavioral categories that show symptoms of schizophrenia. And some of the symptoms you see on the screen are quite similar to depression, but obviously schizophrenia is a quite different condition than depression. Um, and there are things like auditory and, and visual hallucinations that are specific to psychotic disorders uh, like schizophrenia that we might not see in someone who has a, a depressive disorder. But what I want you to get from looking at these slides is that in mental health, behavior changes often precede some sort of major psychiatric event, whether it be a depressive episode or what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk, what we call relapse in schizophrenia, which is sort of a major symptom exacerbation of schizophrenia symptoms. And some of these behaviors are, are quite consistent, uh, but obviously these conditions have a lot of nuances that are specific to those conditions, um, which I haven't discussed, but I want you to take note of. But there's a main research question that's involved here that's saying, can we actually predict these behavior changes that precede a major psychiatric event? The impact of that is that we might be able to actually have someone receive treatment early on before these symptoms uh, exacerbate quite significantly. Now, to make this a little bit more realistic and to talk a little bit about relapse in schizophrenia, which is what I'm gonna be focusing on for the rest of this talk, uh, I wanted to show you an example of what relapse is like. So what I have on the screen is data that was collected uh, from, an individual's, from an individual's smartphone. And this data actually uh, shows a, uh, someone's speech frequency collected over time. Now I wanna note that the smartphone only collected whether someone was speaking. It didn't collect the content of a conversation to protect this individual's security and privacy. And this person's speech frequency, this is a person who has schizophrenia, sort of is at a, a baseline but then this baseline jumps before this blue bar, which is actually when this individual relapsed. So you can see that significant behavior change. And this is a little bit graphic, so I wanted to state that before I read it, but I wanted to read the clinician's notes that were actually a part of this patient's file. Uh, this is a summary of the clinician's notes, not the exact quote, um, to give you a sense about what this person experienced. So this person was hospitalized 125 days into a study called CrossCheck, which is the main work that uh, was done to actually collect that data. Um, and this person had an episode of substance abuse and hallucinations, which made them report seeing a spirit who instructed them to essentially threaten their sister and destroy their possessions, at which the uh, patient actually went and threatened their sister with a knife and set fire to their sister's dolls. So relapse is dangerous. It's dangerous to a person and it's dangerous to people they care about. So if we can actually predict when these behavior changes occur, which is the main goal for this work, uh, we can actually intervene before uh, these symptoms exacerbate to a point where a person needs to be hospitalized. 
Um, and restating it more simply, the main goal of this work was to use what we call passive sensing data. That's data that can be collected with little or no effort from a human to predict early warning signs of relapse. Uh, those are those specific behavior changes I was talking about. Uh, and we looked at doing this using a smartphone, which is quite a ubiquitous piece of technology in our society that most individuals with schizophrenia have. So I'm not gonna talk too in depth about this technique, but I wanted to give a highlight to where we actually look towards in literature to develop this approach to predict these behavior changes. So we actually looked at the literature for multi-sensor anomaly detection in machines, things like airplanes, where you might wanna look for a fault that might be indicative of a machine failure. And what this approach did in the literature is it actually collected data from sensors, a lot of sensors in these machines, and it developed what we call an encoder-decoder neural network. Uh, for those in the machine learning literature, this is sort of a, a variation of an autoencoder, not a variational autoencoder, though. Um, and uh, the idea was we might be able to actually create an algorithm that can recreate normal behavior for this machine. And if normal behavior is quite different than behavior that might precede a fault, ideally, we might be able to actually look at the recreation error near a fault. And since this algorithm was not trained to predict fault-like behavior, it should actually find anomalies, things that have high recreation error right before a fault occurs. Now, this is a little tough to do, bringing it from a machine context to a behavioral context. As for those who are familiar with schizophrenia, the behaviors that we might see preceding relapse are quite idiosyncratic across individuals. So we have to be able to somehow tailor this algorithm in a precision context towards individuals before they relapse. And from a technical challenge, which happens a lot when we try to implement neural network-based techniques into medicine, um, these techniques are often described as black box algorithms, meaning it's kind of hard to know how they do decision making. And this added an additional research question for this study, which was, can we actually develop a methodology to interpret the anomalies that our algorithm might predict, which again, are supposed to signify those behavior changes. So really, can we get at the actual symptoms that change in individuals before they relapse? So this study and the way we collected data was actually through a study called Crosscheck. Uh, it was a year-long study that recruited patients with schizophrenia to find digital indicators of relapse. And we collected a variety of behaviors off of smartphones. Uh, these behaviors were sometimes derived from, or most were derived from smartphone sensing technology and encapsulated a lot of things that from the literature we might see before an individual relapses. Um, to be specific, we actually uh, found we actually collected more than 20,000 days of data from individuals, and this was a continuous um, collection. And we looked at creating features that were an hourly granularity for each of these patients, and we collected data from 60 individuals with patients specifically in the smartphone arm of the study, uh, and of which 18 relapsed throughout this year-long period. So just very briefly to look again into how we made this approach occur for those who are interested in the machine learning side, I'm gonna go through this fast. Um, be, what we did again was we trained an algorithm, a neural network, to actually recreate behaviors that were in what we call days of relative health. Those are days that occur not near relapse, when a patient is experiencing relatively normal routine behavior for them. And our hypothesis was that near relapse, specifically in the 30 days preceding relapse, that there should be some sustain, sustained deviation from routine behavior. So to give an example, we have an actual behavior that measures the number of incoming calls collected from a patient and the recreation from our network. And I've sort of blocked out the 30 days preceding that red bar, which is the relapse event. And when we take away that bar, you can see that there is somewhat of a difference visually, but the idea is for the algorithm to be able to find these differences. And what we found was we actually were able to detect 108% increase, that's a median increase, and anomalies across patients within that 30-day period preceding relapse compared to the number of anomalies we found in days of relative health. But this is not enough to just state this number. What clinicians really want to know is what exact symptoms change before relapse, because those are the actual early warning sign indicators that we want to get at. So I'm gonna give two examples because we created a methodology that essentially took the behaviors that were collected before relapse, specifically the anomalies that our algorithm was detected and compared them to behaviors on days of relative health. So I have three behaviors here and the two left boxes actually are a collection of the anomalies that we detected in two relapse events for this participant. And the right hand box plot on each plot 
is a collection of the same behaviors in all days of relative health. We compare these behaviors with our clinician's notes that stated that the participant experienced hallucinations and sleep changes prior to the second relapse event. And we found actually that um, both that social behavior in a variety of formats changed for this participant before relapse. And this might actually be consistent with, though we don't know for sure, the hallucinations that this person experienced. I'm going to show one more example before wrapping up the talk, but this is someone whose sleep behavior changed, and we found that sleep behavior actually was also in the clinician's notes prior to relapse, though I want to note that the direction of sleep behavior our smartphones detected was a little bit different than what the clinician notes said, which might be a product of the sleep detection algorithms that we actually utilize when looking at these smartphones. So I want to wrap up with two research questions that we're looking at. So one, of course, is the implementation of the system because there's a lot that would be involved with actually creating a system that sends alerts for interventions using our anomaly detection procedure. And we need to work with clinicians and come up with creative ways because I think these implementation channels are obviously going to be a big hurdle towards actually putting a system like this into practice. And my last question, and this is something I actually know David Moore's group is looking at at Northwestern, is can we actually apply the same method to detect other psychiatric events? Um, this methodology just detects behavioral changes and it was trained on schizophrenia, but I don't see why we couldn't apply this to different populations such as depression, but obviously the implications are different when we study these populations. And uh, that's my talk. This, patient, this paper was uh, published on JMIR, M Health, and U Health recently, and feel free to get in touch and I'll take questions from here. I think due to lack of time, we're going to jump right in with Emily. Emily, are you ready to go? And then we'll use any extra time for questions for both of you. Great. Uh, great. OK, so I'm going to share my screen. OK, cool. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily. Um, I'm a second year PhD student here at Cornell, primarily advised by uh, Deb Restrin and Nikki Dell. My research broadly is on building and testing technologies that support the future of care work. Um, and today I'll be talking specifically about work we've done over the last couple of years with home health aides here in New York City. Uh, this is a joint work with a research group across uh, WA Cornell and Cornell Tech, led by Nikki Dell on the tech side and uh, Dr. Maddie Sterling on the wild side. And in this, we partner extensively with um, 1199 SEIU. Uh, the largest healthcare workers union in the US. Uh, it's got something like 400,000 members. So to begin, when we think about what healthcare will look like in the future, and indeed what it's already started to look like um, amidst the pandemic, we can see that the at-home setting is crucial to the future of how we think about health and wellness. We know more and more people are seeking care in the home, uh, older adults, people with chronic conditions, and any one of us who might want to stay inside um, and limit our exposure to COVID. And we know that our experiences in home settings can make or break our outcomes. This is fairly intuitive, just thinking about post-op care and how important it is to the success of any procedure to observe careful recovery protocols. Lastly, we know that at a policy level, as healthcare shift towards uh, value-based payment schemes, patient outcomes are of increasing importance to how providers themselves are paid. And within this landscape of home care, we also know that the role of the at-home caregiver is essential. When we speak about caregivers, we often break it out into two types, formal caregivers, so paid aides, often from an outside agency, and informal caregivers uh, who are most often family. In this work, we focus on formal caregivers, professionals who work often for an agency under the supervision of registered nurse. Uh, they're with clients in their homes on a regular basis, so you might have a patient encounter many different aids week to week. They assist patients with a wide range of things, including activities of daily living, household duties. They might escort patients to doctor's appointments and often help them keep track of information between appointments and providers. Uh, critically, they provide companionship and emotional support. They're sort of the glue holding together a patient who might be struggling with managing a complex illness without much support. And despite their centrality to home care and the importance of home care itself, home care work is really hard and currently isn't compensated fairly, nor does it really afford home care workers enough training or tooling for what they face in practice. These caregivers work long hours caring for people with serious illnesses, heart failure, or dementia, the work is difficult and unpredictable. We sort of have to be ready to respond to whatever the client may need. And it also often places aides in life or death situations, having to make quick snap decisions with serious consequences for clients' health. The majority of this workforce are women, usually Black and or Latinx. Wages are low, often close to minimum. So we can start to see how this is a labor force that's essential to the entire enterprise of healthcare, but exploited. 
And perhaps because it's so poorly compensated, the job itself is exploding. BLS estimates have job growth for home care workers outpacing national averages by nearly 4x. It's actually the fastest growing segment of the US economy. So you have a workforce of mostly Black and Latinx women engaging in grueling daily care of societies most vulnerable in their homes, and they're neither bolstered with pathways for advancement, nor equipped properly, nor compensated adequately. And to me, that's a particular kind of systemic failure, the extent to which they're underappreciated. Because if you think about it, AIDS spend more time with patients than any other provider. They're naturally there to observe and monitor changes in patients' health. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, let's look more closely at the situation of an aide caring for a patient in the home. Uh, day in and day out, her tasks are pretty routine. She comes in, clocks in, carries out the tasks a nurse has prescribed, clocks out, leaves. One day though, she notices something's changed. Maybe her client seems down, distracted, agitated. Uh, she doesn't want to go out for her daily walks. She doesn't want to call her family. So for the next few days, the aide keeps an eye out. She watches her client's behaviors, keeps an eye on her moods. She has to figure out how to judge or grade what's happening. When does she sound an alarm? One day she decides that it's too much. The client seems too depressed. The aide doesn't know what to do. So then she has to figure out who does she call? Getting an opinion from a clinician would be the gold standard, but it's nearly impossible to get one on the phone. And it's often not clear who specifically to contact. Calling her agency might implicate the aide herself in providing inadequate care. And agency coordinators don't actually have the training to help them interpret patient state. Calling EMS, of course, leads to an ambulance and a hospital visit, both of which are terrible for the patient's health and carry significant costs. And let's remember, it's not even certain this is an actual emergency. So here we see two sets of problems. One, aides are not afforded the tools or training to monitor and respond to patients' conditions. Uh, some in our context have actually told us they've never received CPR training. And therefore, their perspectives are missing from the healthcare system. They often don't get a chance to interface with the visiting nurses responsible for patient care and there don't really exist structured ways where they observe about the patient to make it back to the broader clinical team. All of this, again, despite the fact that they're with the patient every day and have a better vantage point than anyone else. So that's the central thesis that we consider in our work, the idea that AIDS are currently underutilized and that this is hurting not just the AIDS themselves, but also broadly the quality of care we can provide to these patients. You can see this is particularly important in the context of mental and behavioral health. To explore possible futures in which we might realize this potential, we've carried out a multi-year study of AIDS and their associated home health ecosystems uh, with our partners at 1199 The Union. Everything I just described was material we learned from a series of interviews and focus groups we conducted in 2018 and 2019 with AIDS, coordinators, nurses, physicians, social workers, and patients themselves, as many people in this complex ecosystem as we could reach. Um, and I'll describe a recently published study we did with them in which we prototyped and tested a tool that would help address some of the problems we uncovered. From all of our work, we distilled three key needs for AIDS. One, better tools for collecting these bits of information they naturally observe about the patient. Uh, two, better mechanisms for communicating that information to other stakeholders. And three, simply better access to educational content, for instance, videos of how to do CPR. To explore what this could look like, we created a pretty simple prototype of a digital technology that appeared to give them exactly these three things. Our prototype was non-functional, meaning there's no actual backend application. We simply mocked up some app screens that were intentionally low fidelity enough to give AIDS enough of a hint towards the concept to tell us how to fill in the blanks. This is co-design, um, as Mark Matthews and some other panelists have mentioned. Here you see the first of those three needs fulfilled, a simple data collection decision support system. Um, to address AIDS needs around communication, we mocked up a tool for asynchronous chat and message flagging. And uh, to address their needs for educational content, a very simple uh, system for accessing video tutorials. A key part of this method was showing these mock-ups to as many people as we could get in touch with to get everyone's perspectives and how these tools would affect their work. And what we found was somewhat surprising. First, AIDS keyed in on the data collection features of the prototype pretty quickly as a tool for helping them negotiate. As you can see in these quotes, AIDS identified that uh, it would help them prove to their employers they had done their work and give them a way to document rising concerns before they hit emergency thresholds. Uh, we found that everyone in the ecosystem was pretty concerned about the privacy implications of introducing data collection into the home care ecosystem. Um, you can see one of our aides telling us specifically the patients wouldn't like it, they need to be informed, they can get funky, they can feel like you're spying on them. We also found mixed opinions across our aid participants on whether the new features would actually help or hurt them. Some thought data collection would introduce new burdens on what's already a hard job, and others felt the tools would give them reassurance, something to look to in moments of uncertainty. 
So all of this gave us some hints towards where our work could go. Uh, there's clearly some appetite for providing aids with the basic affordances of a data collection system. And compellingly, our findings hint at a set of unexplored tensions around surveillance and data in home health. So as next steps, uh, that's what we're delving into. We're intrigued by the invisible knowledge aids told us they carry about their patients, things that are hard to parameterize like moods, anxieties, levels of social support. Mapping that knowledge to information that might be useful to clinicians under uh, both current and future uh, paradigms of care is of course an open challenge. And finally, we're very interested in how to balance tensions around surveillance in this space. Any technology in the home must respect uh, safety, comfort, and dignity for both the patient and the caregiver. In reality though, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has so dramatically changed the picture of how home uh, care is delivered. In our recent paper in JAMA Internal Medicine, we discuss what we've learned from AIDS about uh, challenges in the post-COVID world. And the next leg of our work will be focusing on how to address those emergent needs. Um, so in summation, formal caregivers can give us a new perspective on patients' health, especially their mental and behavioral health, but only if we give them the right tools and training to do so. Um, and we need more work to understand how to do this while balancing privacy, security, agency, and dignity uh, for patients and caregivers alike. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, I would invite um, Emily and Dan to look at some of the questions that are on the Q&A that are there for you um, and respond to them. Um, I know we are at the end, end of our time now, so I just wanted to do a quick wrap up. Thank you all for attending um, and we are, are really excited to uh, invite new partners and, and collaborators in our effort to make precision behavioral health a success. As you saw in the talks that we are um, advancing research in mobile computing, human computer interaction, design, natural language processing and AI, but also trying to focus on solutions that are acceptable and useful to those whose lives are being impacted by these technologies. And as many of the, the speakers and panelists have already highlighted, it is essential to have strong partnership with academic researchers, clinical practitioners, patients, and those who are developing products to bridge the research to practice gap that we so often see in behavioral health technology. We are forming a consortium to support the research that we hope will dramatically improve uh, people's behavioral health and their overall quality of life. We are aspiring to build solutions that are accessible and that can reduce healthcare disparities and also the ballooning healthcare costs. So if you're interested in joining us in our mission and learn more, please visit our website, uh, which is pbh tech.cornell.edu. There is a link to contacting us. If you want to find out more about um, consortium membership as well, please contact us. So I want to um, thank you all very much for your time. This is um, just the start. I hope many of you will join us, help us, support us um, in, in carrying forward um, some of the, the work that we have taken on uh, under the Precision Behavioral Health Umbrella. Thank you very much. That we will end today's lunch. Thank you.